Hello, I'm Rob Forsyth. Welcome to Liberalism in Question. In this half-hour podcast series from the Centre for Independent Studies, we explore questions and challenges to liberalism today. My guest today is Gordon Menzies, Dr. Gordon Menzies, who's Associate Professor of Economics at the University of Technology in Sydney and visitor of the Institute for New Economic Thought at Oxford. He's been that and also for many years an economist with the Reserve Bank of Australia. Gordon, welcome to Liberalism in Question. Thank you very much, Robert. Gordon, uh, you've written a book entitled Western Fundamentalism, which I want to explore with you. Can you tell us a bit, a bit about what is Western fundamentalism and why you think it's worth writing about? Thank you. Um, yes, so I can tell you the, where I got the idea from and then I'll tell you why I think it's worth writing about. Um, a number of years ago, um, I was fortunate enough to get a Commonwealth scholarship to study at Oxford and do a PhD there. And while I was there, I thought I would um, dip my toe into the world famous debating society, the Oxford Union. And uh, it was a marvellous experience. Uh, I was very impressed with the union, but also very disturbed. So what impressed me was the brilliance of the speakers. But I actually thought some of the debates were very superficial. Um, some debates were won by appealing to a law that the UK had passed a few years ago, rather than arguing something from first principles. And I thought this was rather odd. So I went and spoke with one of the leaders and he uh, very quickly saw what I was concerned about. And he said, Gordon, you have to understand that everybody who comes to this university uncritically believes in three things, democracy, free market liberalism and sexual freedom. So democracy, we all know that is free market liberalism is what's sometimes called economic rationalism in Australia. It's just market economics and sexual freedom. So um, I coined the phrase Western fundamentalist because the fact that he said that they unquestioningly believed in these things reminded me of what people sometimes say about religious fundamentalists, that they unquestioningly believe things. So that's where the title of the book comes from. Um, but I think why it's a coherent idea is not just that a number of people in Oxford um, nearly 20 years ago thought that they were three things that fitted together, but I think um, the thing that unites all of those is a certain conception of freedom. So democracy frees us from dictators, free market liberalism frees us to get on with our commercial lives and sexual freedom obviously frees us to have sex with any partner regardless of any pre-existing commitments as long as it's consensual. So um, they, they're, they're not only um, interesting historically that a group of people tend to believe them all together, but I think they have a unifying theme with a certain conception of freedom in them. I'm talking with Gordon Menzies and we're discussing Western fundamentalism, freedom of choice, individual choice. Gordon, it is about freedom of choice. That's what you regard as a Western fundamental, the, what's the, word, the uncritical acceptance of the primacy of freedom of choice. This is basically classical liberalism, isn't it? Um, well, there's, there's, many, there's many dimensions to, to classical liberalism, but I'd suppose if I was to choose um, my exemplar as John Stuart Mill, which I do, which I do in the book, um, he was the uh, originator of the, the do no harm principle and said, in modern parlance, you can do whatever you like as long as you don't hurt anybody else. So, yes, it's it's very closely aligned to liberalism. That that would be fair. I I, I was uh, very interested in the fact that you included not just democracy and free markets, which I think are commonly associated with uh, classical liberalism, but you also included something I'd never thought about involved, and that is sexual freedom. Isn't that a moral issue rather than a, in a very different way from the others? Why do you include sexual freedom as part of, in effect, modern liberalism? Yes. So one of the things I do in the book is I look at sexual freedom and, and I do what I, what I hope is an interesting um, exercise. Some of the opponents of sexual freedom, as it's played out in the West since the 1970s, uh, look at the effects on children of uh, families being less likely to be intact and so on. And that's, uh, that's a reasonable thing to do. But I don't do that in this book, or not, not uh, to any great extent. I focus on the effects on the partners, on the sexual partners. 
So um, one of the themes that, of the book is the, is the danger of economic thinking or market thinking seeping out into other areas in society. So market thinking, it's sometimes called neoliberalism, as you know, the idea of um, conceiving of society as nothing else but the interactions of selfish individuals pursuing their own ends. Uh, so we, we might call that neoliberalism. And when that applies to all areas of society, I think it's very dangerous. So um, why do I include sexual freedom? Because I think, sadly, although um, many proponents of sexual freedom see it as a triumph of left-wing politics to pursue social justice, and I don't deny there's truth in that, sadly, I view it also as a triumph of neoliberalism. I see it as taking economic thinking into the area of relationships, so primacy of self-interest, disposability, et cetera, taking it into the area of relationships where it doesn't uh, really belong. And so, um, yeah, I regard, I regard the modern sexual milieu as a kind of um, a seepage of market thinking in, into wider society. The word neoliberalism is no longer used, I, as far as I can tell today, except for those who want to criticise what happened in the, in the 80s and 70s. But you, but, uh, but, but you still want to keep using it as a distinct period of time that's still having an effect today. Is that you're arguing that liberal, neoliberalism still has, has its power today? Let's not get hung up on what we call it, but what, all I'll say is that um, the idea of conceiving of society as individuals only, not as groups, individuals only, interacting in something with something like a market mentality, uh, that's what I object to, and I think that that's happened more and more uh, with sexual freedom. Let me explain what I mean by that, Rob. What do we want from markets? Well, we go into markets seeking mutually advantageous trades. Mm. And I can sell my computer to you. Um, it's a thing. It doesn't have feelings. There's no moral need for it to have relational proximity to me. So if I part from it, then there's no moral problem with that that I can see. Nobody in the West today think, and, and so we call, we call a computer in that context a commodity. Nobody in the West today thinks that children are a commodity. I can't sell you my children. Uh, they're not things, they have feelings, and they have a yes. moral right to my proximity. Now, what I believe about the sexual revolution is that to an extent, it's transformed sexual partners from people into the category of things where they can be separated easily from you and people don't see as much of a moral problem with that as they used to. So the Christian idea that um, if you have sex with someone, it somehow joins them to you and it creates moral obligations is completely gone as far as I can see in the West. If you're right, if you're right, there's been a growth from liberalism, which was once a economic and political philosophy, into a wider society. I was thinking of people as nothing other than individuals and so forth. Is this because, and I'm not sure you are right, I still think there is still um, more, to, more to society than, than just that, but let's describe it for the moment. Isn't this because, in fact, liberalism has been remarkably successful in, in economic liberalism, I'm thinking particularly here, uh, and, 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 uh, and political, in producing remarkable prosperity and, and uh, freedom for people, so liberal societies uh, are a good society to live in, people, uh, they're the prosperous societies. On the whole, it's the very success that maybe has led to what you think is this overreach of liberal ideas. Yeah, I completely agree with that. And, and I want to be clear that I, I am talking about a direction of movement. Yes, I think there is more going in society than, than purely the interactions of individuals um, conceived of individuals pursuing their own benefit. I think there is more to society going on than that. Um, yes, I, I think you're right. So um, as an economist, I'm very aware of the benefits of um, markets and how they're very efficient organising devices. Um, I'll go into a, a few reasons why I think that in a moment, but um, if you're not an economist, um, it's not a bad comparison to make of regions in the world that were very culturally similar but had different political and economic systems and just compare them. So North and South Korea, Hong yes. Kong and China before it liberalised, 
um, East and West Germany, you know, it's you can see clear examples where um, liberalism, broadly conceived, has had huge economic benefits. So I don't deny that. Uh, as an economist, I'd want to add two caveats. The first is uh, so-called externalities, which are unintended knock-on effects when people interact in markets. So the classic one is when you buy something that's been produced with a very polluting technology and it's not reflected in the price. Markets don't work very well for that. And the second one, which is taken up by feminists and others, is the danger of what's called commodification, when people are turned into things, which is what I was referring to earlier. Yes, yes. Now, you, um, now you're saying how, how, how successful liberalism has been, certainly in economics, and that we're talking about the danger, as it were, of overspill, where it becomes a philosophy of everything rather than a philosophy just for mm-hmm. certain narrow human activities. Yeah, yeah. You, you're going to tell me, well, I'm not an economist. Very quickly, why it was so successful and what's, what's good about it? Sure. So one of the things that um, markets do is it very quickly resolves problems of over or under supply. So um, if we went to a country, an imaginary country, or if you need concreteness, I don't know, think of North Korea or something, if there's a, um, a hailstorm and your crop of bananas are wiped out, or whatever they grow in North Korea. Um, I don't think it's bananas. <laughs> Kim, Kim Jong-un has got to point guns to people, to consumers, and say, consume less bananas, and he has to point guns to producers and say, produce more bananas. Now, in a market economy, um, uh, we'll go to Queensland because they do grow bananas there, Rob. Um, if there's a storm and the banana crop's wiped out, the price of bananas will go up. And without any guns being pointed, that will stimulate producers to produce more bananas and it will encourage consumers to consume less bananas. So you get the result um, that you wanted purely through an operation of the price mechanism. And the price mechanism right. is a very effective organising device in society. So, yeah, that's why. So no one has to be, I think I read somewhere, I think it was uh, Matt Ridley or somewhere talking about in London, he said every every lunchtime, this is before COVID changed at all, there are so many hundred thousand lunches provided. Uh, everyone gets what they want. Why isn't the lunch commissioner getting the proper reward you'd get for this that's remarkable right. organisation? Yes, that's right. That's right. Yes. <laughs> and, and this goes right. I mean, this, this dispersed a system where it doesn't require all-knowing top-down control, which allows dispersed I- initiative. Mm. When it works well, uh, go back to your computer, you're going to sell me, if if the computer is worth less to you than the money I'm giving you and the computer is worth more to me than the money I'm paying, we hmm. both can walk away happy from a trade. Yeah, it's a mutually so, advantageous so, trade. That's correct. Right. So on the whole, just trading. Well, what, what what you need for that, Rob, though, is you need the computer to be alienable, which is a legal term, meaning that of course. it can be I separated think. from me in law and, and also you want it to be morally alienable as well. Yeah, no, I, I, I take your point entirely. Um, is there a distinction between liberalism as... A narrow focus, a narrow political philosophy, or and economic, economic philosophy, not be the word, and trying to turn it into a all there is about life. Because I noticed that even Adam Smith, whether he's a liberal or not, is another question, I guess. But Adam Smith wasn't content with the wealth of nations. He had to write the theory of moral sentiments, in other words, human beings feeling for each other. And on this, uh, in this podcast series, I had quite a few people say, liberalism by itself is not enough. We need other other virtues and commitments to family, to, to um, conservative value, values, that just by itself, liberalism is too thin, too thin to be a philosophy of life. It should be kept where it's best done as a way to organise your politics and a way to run your economy. Yes. So, well, first of all... You, you, um, you agree with that? I would say to that that um, uh, I think the do-no-harm principle is not a bad guide for law, I think law is often the lowest form of morality, but it is an important form of morality. And so I think if you want to make something illegal, you need more than saying you think it's wrong. You need to say that it's clearly doing harm to others and so on in a way that justifies you making it a law. So um, that's the first thing I'd say. The next thing I'd say, I guess, about freedom, uh, which is what which liberalism values very highly, Um, What I'd say about freedom is that I make a distinction in the book between freedom from and freedom for. 
So freedom from is when you're freed from something that's constraining you and constraining your agency. And freedom for is when you're freed for the purpose that, that you might have. So if I free my, um, uh, my computer mouse cord uh, from being tangled up, I'm freeing it, but then I use it as a computer mouse cord so I can't make it into a car or an atomic bomb or something. And so um, that's a distinction that I make in the book. Now, it seems to me that Western fundamentalism is naive liberalism uh, because it's naive about evil. The idea is that if we free ourselves economically, um, free ourselves from dictators and free ourselves sexually, we can do no wrong or, or at least we'll, we'll, we'll wander our way to, to living better. Now, I don't think myself that that's actually right. I think that we need a freedom for as well as a freedom from. So um, if I may just speak for a moment as a Christian, um, Christianity is a worldview where there is both freedom from and freedom for. Um, Jesus said the worst form of um, slavery was not actually political institutions or whatever. He said that whoever commits sin is a slave to sin. And so the freedom from in Christianity is um, Jesus helping us with the problem of sin. And the freedom for is, is an, a notion of adoption as God's children, which is a form of human flourishing. I think it's very I, telling I, I, that Western fundamentalism doesn't have a notion of freedom from, and I think that's freedom, free, for, freedom for, for, for. And I think it's because well, it's naive about evil. That's very interesting. Um, I'm Rob Forsyth. This is a liberalism question. My guest today is uh, Gordon Menzies from uh, University of Technology, Sydney. Uh, isn't the, the problem, or rather the reality, Gordon, that we simply have different views about what freedom is for? We're a pluralist society, and that's why we need to be a liberal society, because we don't agree upon the moral goods uh, on the whole. We don't agree on the big questions of what to live for. And we, and we need to be a society which people can freely have different conceptions of the good uh, and, and on the whole get, get on fairly well together. Isn't that the reason we need a liberal society? Yes, that's that's a great point, Robin. And, and I, um, again, speaking as a Christian, I, I think I would, my justification for um, some kind of liberalism is that God allows people the freedom to do wrong things and say wrong things and believe wrong things. So I regard it as an obligation I have to, up to a point, um, allow that for others. It's an interesting question of what that point is. Um, I, I suppose I'd go back to, um, um, I, I, think it, I think there is a fundamental problem in not taking evil seriously in society, though I I said a moment ago that I think that Western fundamentalism is naive about evil, and I'll give two evidences for that. Um, the first is, have you noticed that when people dislike politicians, they sometimes pull out the old power corrupts? Uh, but, of course, there's an alternative, which is just that power reveals that people who commit ordinary, everyday evil, like you and I, when we get into positions of power where our actions influence a lot of people, we almost inevitably will do wrong things. And so it's, I think, a mistake to say that power only corrupts. I think it reveals. And the second evidence that I'd put for it is that the tendency, the very disturbing tendency for people to confine the word evil to cinema scope evil, like the Holocaust or terrorism or pedophilia or something like that, and to disown it for their ordinary lives. And I think this is very disturbing. Um, and I use the image of a centrifuge in the book. I talk about centrifugal vilification, where you know a centrifuge spins round and round and pushes everything to the outside. Well, unfortunately, in the West today, I think people's notion of evil is such that they push out all their condemnation of evil away from themselves onto people like Hitler, pedophiles, and so on, who deserve condemnation. But what disturbs me is the motivation for centrifugal vilification. Can, can I pick that up? Because one of my pushbacks was going to be this. Rather than living in a world in which there is no morality, we live in a massively moralizing, judgmental world, at least in places like social media. I don't bet the, bet out there in the real world, as it were. And there's a massive amount of judgment going on, of, of not quite 
you're as bad as Hitler, but a lot of people blaming a lot more people than Hitler for all kinds of things. It's been a mark of social media and mm-hmm. of uh, a kind of tribal, a kind of tribalism that's coming to our society, um, kind of pop, populist or even postmodernist. Surely our problem is not no morality. It's we're almost being judged out of our lives by other people. Now, this surely is different from the world where you're pointing for us. I beg your pardon. Decision, am I right? Am I right? Firstly, am I right? Uh, uh, yeah, we people certainly have strong, strong moral For all kinds of things. I mean, sexism, racism, mm. homophobia, transphobia, uh, innocent comments can suddenly be made a matter of uh, people losing their jobs, the so-called cancel culture phenomenon. Sure. What's sure. all that about, do you think? What's all that about? Um, yeah, I, I think that, um, well, look, I think that um, uh, my ears prick up whenever anybody makes a claim about injustice and I, I try and listen carefully uh, because I do think that um, uh, it behoves us well to, to think about justice and to, and to look at cases of injustice and people sometimes overreact to things. Um, so that doesn't completely undercut their cause. So, for example, during um, the Black Lives Matters protests, the many of the or well, some of the protesters had all sorts of ideas about all sorts of things which I didn't agree with. But on the basic point that there was um, systemic racism in the police and this led to George Floyd's death in an unwarranted way, I, I completely sympathised. Um, as far as how vitriolic moral and other discussions get, I think liberalism needs a protocol of conversation and disagreement as well, not just the freedom to disagree, but I think it needs a protocol of disagreement. So um, let me use this example. If you're driving along and your car is doing very badly, um, some people will put their foot on the accelerator harder and just try and get through the problem. And other people will stop, pull over, and look under the bonnet. Now, I think um, some conversations are a bit like this that when they start to go wrong, people talk louder and um, yes. nastier. Whereas actually, it's not a bad idea sometimes to pull over, pull up the bonnet, and look at what's underneath people's views. Because often people's fundamental convictions about life determine their detailed opinions. And you can spend a lot of time arguing about the detailed opinions when really there's some fundamental I, drivers underneath, which is why I call the book Western. Another reason I call the book Western fundamental. But but, but, but I, I I agree that entirely. That's exactly right. My point is that there's something else going on here, rather than individual freedom of choice. I think behind. What do you think's going on? Well, I'm trying to work it out. Uh, there's a tremendous anxiety about inequality in our society today. Yeah. Tremendous a tremendous concern about people not being treated with equal dignity. Mm. Um, in fact, this is a, my own personal view is this is a hangover, not from some of it's from liberalism, some of it's from the deeply uh, historico Christian background in our culture and so forth, which mm. treats that people should be treated equally. People are not sure why, but they, there's a whole other set of things going on out there that aren't just about individual freedom of choice, or at least not your individual freedom of choice. It might be mine, <laughs> but yours, your freedom of choice is deeply constrained because if you say that, you're, you're, you're breaking many of the net modern taboos um, mm. in society. You're either, it's, it's to do with concerns about racism, concerns about sexism and other matters. Mm. That's, don't, do you not agree that's also going on? It's something other than freedom of choice. Yeah, I am. Um, um, you, 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 just... you must know, you know, I'm talking about, you're a university professor, you know exactly what I'm talking about. <laughs> I don't just uh, actually appeal to um, John Stuart Mill in my analysis of Western fundamentalism. I also appeal to um, Friedrich Nietzsche. And um, oh, yes. he, had a, he had an idea that um, was that really in the early Western period, in the end of the Roman Empire, well, actually during the Roman Empire as well, that the world was taken over by what he called the slave revolt of Christianity. Yes. And all the wonderful, in his view, virtues of Greece and Rome, which are celebrating power, strength, and so on, yes. were uh, were wrecked by Christianity. And he advocated a return to those Greco-Roman values. Mm. Now, one of the things I deal with in the book is that I do think that that is happening in the West today. But then the question is, looking over the three fundamentals, 
democracy, free market liberalism and sexual freedom. I think um, sexual freedom and free market liberalism are more marked by a kind of Nietzschean valuing of power and beauty, whereas democracy isn't. And why is this? And my answer in the book, uh, Rob, is that I think that the Second World War, for all its incalculable tragedy, was actually a blessing to the West because the memory of it still remains in politics. And so a card-carrying Western fundamentalist, when it comes to their political pronouncements, they will value people equally with the memory of the Second World War hanging over their head. They will still support one person, one vote, even though it's clear that some people are more capable at making decisions than others. But when it comes to their economic and their sexual lives, they cut themselves some slack and allow themselves to be more selfish and more Nietzschean. Nietzsche, of course, uh, is not is one sense a liberal, but one sense an anti-liberal, because he holds that that uh, it's all just about power, not just re- just claims of truth are, are merely claims to power. Yes, and he was mixed, he wasn't a egalitarian at all. He despised no, majority, no. majority government and so exactly. On. Now today, uh, I, in certain parts of our society, the suspicion of truth. For, for only being about power uh, is is quite strong. It's in the critical race mm-hmm. theories in other areas. Yeah. But this is done. But this is done in the name of equality, not in the name of the Uberman. Yes, I think that's right. I think that's right. Uh, interesting. Though, I will. There is a little bit of a pushback here, which is that um, um, you'll notice that when we search for equality, we never use words like compassion. They're supposed they're supposed to be patronising. We use the word. You know it, empowerment. And I think it's a very interesting uh, linguistic testimony to Nietzsche that power finds its way even into notions <laughs> of compassion. Oh dear. <laughs> this, that, 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 I mean, we are, I think the great strength and energy of our society is the combination of a Hellenistic and Christian, Christian worldview, which are never quite at peace. And that leads to something that the dynamism of the West, even, even when it's dysfunctional, like in some of these other recent movements, Nietzsche. Is also since picked up by what he would regard as a slave mentality. I don't know what things are like at Oxford nor at UTS, but there's been some research to show that many young people actually are suspicious of democracy and even of free market economics. They 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 think that socialism or something like it is a, is a something that ought to be preferred. We've done research at CIS as well to show that a surprising number of younger people uh, believe in such things like that. There's been mm. evidence to think why this might be so, uh, to, uh, mm. to do with the, the issue of the housing crisis, the, the, mm. their own sense in which life is not treating them as they will. will. Mm-hmm. What's your view on that, Gordon? Yeah, I, I think that um, many people are disillusioned. Um, more people are disillusioned by the freedoms that the 1980s birthed in economics than was the case uh, when I wrote my book. I think that um, inequality has emerged as a huge issue and the very unsavoury spectre after the global financial crisis of um, lots of um, bankers and institutions that behave very badly, getting off it fairly well and, and getting huge um, subsidies of public money going their way. Um, so I think that that's that was distasteful. And also the increase in inequality is distasteful as well. So I think that um, I think there is more sympathy uh, with left-wing economics. I'm not sure it's understood very well. I think that um, many people bandy around the world the word um, Marxism and so on without understanding much of how socialist no. economies work or how what Marx thought. But all the same, I would agree with you that there's a growing unease, especially with inequality. Uh, you'd have heard of the work of Thomas Piketty and people like that. And yes, so yes. Um, that's, that's uh, started a bit of a new conversation. But I do think that there's a large slab of people who we might say are economically left and um, in in their social views uh, are are sort of, sorry, I said the wrong thing, a large group of people that um, are quite very comfortable with the market system and accept all aspects of it, but um, when it comes to their own sexual ethics and so on, you might say they're very left. One One of the paradoxes that I really struggle to understand in my book, and I'm still not sure I understand it, is how left-wing people can be so critical of markets and market thinking when it comes to economic matters, 
And yet when it comes to sexual morality, I find that they have um, surrendered to a kind of market mentality um, and without realising that this is, this is a surrender to neoliberalism. Yes. I think if, if I'm learning anything from your remarks, uh, it seems to me that you're saying liberalism has, a, has an important place, but it can't be the whole game. And in fact, it's morally very thin, very thin. Um, we saw this with the harm, when, the, when harm is the only immoral thing, you end up with what you've noticed these days, by the way, all, all moral con- discourse in us now in our society is put in terms of harm. Not you're wrong, but you're harming certain people. The harm, that's all we've got left. Uh, but this is very thin. And I think this is one of the great problems we have, in, at, by, my, by my point of view, out, 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 on the table in our society today. We're morally thin. Yes, if I can say something, and I'll try and say it very, very carefully because um, I'm aware it could be controversial. Whilst I fully support um, a lot of the discussion in sexual ethics on consent at the moment, um, totally support it, um, it's an interesting case study in morality thinning out because if we ask the question, is sex loving, then for most reasonable people, I think saying something's loving would automatically mean that it's consensual. In other words, love would imply consent. But consent doesn't have to apply, uh, imply love. And so you can ask if an act is sexually consensual, even if it's, it's mutually agreed yeah. to be cruel or, or all sorts of things. And time is catching up with this, but I think today the, two, the, only, the only two moral absolutes in these matters of human relationships and sex is authenticity and consent. And I think that's, that's too thin to build a society that, that functions. And a part of the problem of the discourse today is that we're trying to make these thin notions carry the burden of what must be a much thicker discourse. You can't, yes, there's a notion you can't, you can't, you can't you won't carry here. The West doesn't have a picture of human flourishing. And so uh, because it doesn't have that kind of a vision, it makes it uh, extremely difficult to, to look for anything except Minimum acceptable rules of conduct. Yeah, that's yes, sir. Or, or trying to make the minimum to do the work of the maximum. Yes, there's so much more. So much more I'd like to ask you. I, I want to end on this question: the future of liberalism and the future of your fundamental client, your your three fundamentalisms: democracy, sex, and the relation of mankind. Um, I know you're an economist, and therefore, I, whatever you say about the future will definitely be false. I know that's true of all of us. Touche, touche. But. Uh, <laughs> Nonetheless, uh, what, what do you do you see any trends that 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 if you, are you optimistic about liberalism, or you think the future is going to be illiberal, or is it just too um, early to say? I think that it's troubling the way people converse now, and the way that people live in their own echo chambers. Um, many people who are far more familiar with this than I am talk about the power of social media to just guide you to like-minded people, and so I think it is. It is, um, that's very concerning. Um, I think though that there is still a fair amount of support for the idea that, I mean, I think people realise that there is a great good in allowing a certain amount of disagreement. So I don't see, I don't see that um, unravelling. Um, going back to what you said a little while ago about we live in a pluralistic society, I think we do. And the historical question is, how many different views or what degree of difference can a pluralistic society actually function with? And that, I think, is a question which we're not going to answer directly. It may, actually be un- it, it may actually be insoluble, actually, I wonder. I wonder whether there's, there's an inevitable tension that never, never, never ends in this matter. Maybe mm-hmm. it's part of the dynamic of liberal societies as well as their danger. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm, my guest today is, is uh, Gordon Menzies, Associate Professor at Economics UTS, and um, a man who's thought of not just of economics, but trying to think about a much wider range of human concerns. And the book he's been discussing is Western Fundamentalism, Democracy, Sex, and Liberation of Mankind. This has been another podcast from the Centre for Independent Studies. For decades, the CIS has been an independent voice working to deliver evidence-based policy within a classical liberal framework. We rely solely on the generosity of people like you for donations to advance our cause. Head to cis.org.au to see how you can get involved. I'm Rob Forsyth. Thank you for listening.